If you've driven outside of town this week, you've seen clouds of dust and dots of colored farm machinery, some green, some red, and fields of yellow and brown, and you know that the harvest is underway. Um, In our backyard, we have a three-year-old raspberry bush that this year became quite prolific. And this last week, we gathered the very last 12 raspberries of the season. And um, it's kind of sad that we've enjoyed the harvest that's come from that little bush. Um, and already many, this, many of you have visited some of the area apple orchards this fall. You brought home a bag either to have a healthy snack or to turn it into a not-so-healthy, yummy dessert. Um, and we are celebrating the harvest at this time of our life. And it just really... Um, hits very well as we go into chapter 14 of Revelation, talking about the harvest of the Lord, that we can think about that um, as we open our eyes around us. In another month, we're going to celebrate Thanksgiving. It's a reminder of the harvest and the God's provisions that he's given us throughout the year. But there's a different kind of harvest that God is also concerned about. That's a harvest of souls that he is eager to save, and he's mighty to save, as we sang earlier today. And when time comes to the end, there's going to be a final harvest of souls that takes place. God's going to usher in a new dimension, a recreated place on heaven and earth for his eternal kingdom to be set up. And it's a place where he, the master farmer, is going to enjoy the fruit of the labors of his harvest forever and ever. And we as joining with him as his fellow workers in the harvest, we get to enjoy the harvest of the souls of the people that will be around us there in heaven as well. Imagine a Thanksgiving day that never ends. Man, if every day was Thanksgiving, wouldn't that be awesome? A Thanksgiving that goes on and on. And never again do we have to reset the seasons again. We don't have to start every spring with tilling the ground and planting the seeds and having to start over with the crop. Because the one that we just had can last forever. You know, we have to nurture the crop. You have to harvest it up again. This process goes on every year, year after year. No matter where you live in the world, there's some sort of harvest that's being brought in. That's something everyone can relate to. Heaven is a thanksgiving of the harvest of souls that's transformed by the love of God. It's a celebration. It's a heavenly home. It's an eternal kingdom where God rules and reigns in perfect righteousness, where sin and evil are destroyed for good once and for all. Harvest is one of our goals. Thanksgiving is one of our goals. Salvation is one of our goals. And what Jesus started on the cross, and he passed through the empty grave, and he's seated again at the right hand of the Father, and he's going to come again to clean it all up. He's going to make it all good and new. And it completes the first coming with the cross and the second coming with his return. And the harvest is messy. The Bible says it's messy. And last week we talked about the battle of Armageddon, which is a messy cleaning up of things that God has in store. It starts out messy because the kings of this earth, they hate Jesus. The armies draw together against him. They're mad at him. They declare war on him. They're waiting on horseback with drawn swords, ready to kill Jesus all over again. You'd think they'd look back at the first time that Jesus was killed. He didn't stay dead, did he? But they think that this time they can finish him off for good. A true sign of the foolishness and the deception that Satan has in his last attempt to try to win this timeless battle. As we saw last week in Revelation chapter 19, the Lord Jesus will descend and with the sword of truth... Not a sword that slices and dices, but Jesus will win the battle with truth. He will cause the foolish enemies to fall dead in their tracks. Truth wins. Justice wins. Love wins. And Revelation 19 was a kind of a literal description of that battle. But Revelation 14 is another description of the same thing from another point of view. Because as I've said before, Revelation is a book of visions. They are repeated non-chronological visions. So as John wrote what he saw in these different visions, he absorbed the images and the symbols and the illustrations as pictures of what to come. And the picture we have in Revelation 14 is described as a harvest, when God will take a two-punch sweep of harvesting two different groups of people. And that's what we'll look at today. 
First, the harvest of those that belong to the Lord. Start in verse 14 of chapter 14. It says, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and seated on the cloud, one like the Son of Man, with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, saying, Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. This is the harvest of those that belong to the Lord, a harvest that, that looks like this. Because throughout the centuries, many generations of Christ followers have been born again in their spirit, but at some point their bodies died. At the moment that their bodies died, their spirits, which were already born again into Christ and connected to God, were immediately taken from the presence of this dead body on earth and taken into the presence of God in a place that we call heaven. Their bodies were put in a grave where they await a time that God will recreate these bodies again through a process that's called resurrection. And meanwhile, for generations and generations, the cemeteries fill up until that moment at the end of time that we're reading about here in Revelation. The harvest we just read about starts with a resurrection of those bodies who have long turned to dust, but God will reenact the same miracle of what happened to Jesus on Easter morning, a bodily transformation and resurrection. The body put back together again in perfect form with no more weakness or sickness or pain and no potential to die again. Jesus descends with his angels from heaven, accompanied by the spirits of all of those who belong to him, who have died, and those resurrected bodies from the grave are going to be reunited with their spirits, of which they have been separated for all these years. Then a similar thing happens to the Christ followers who are alive at the second coming of Christ. There probably won't be too many of them left because most of them will have been martyred by the time, but for those who are alive... Their bodies and their spirits, which is spirits have already been reborn, but their bodies are going to go through a transformation where they become like resurrected bodies. And they are going to join the spirits and the bodies of those who have already gone before up in the air, who have just gone through that transformation a split second before. And so up in the clouds, you've got this big parade forming up there. You've got Jesus. You've got his angels. You've got the the spirits and the new resurrected bodies of those who have already died, plus the resurrected, transformed bodies and spirits of those who were alive on the earth, all joining together up in the clouds. That's where that reunion is going to take place. And we're going to follow Jesus down to earth for that final battle. We find that some of the chronology of this in Paul's writings in 1 Thessalonians and 1 Corinthians in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, it says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. In 1 Corinthians 15, it talks about the resurrection as well. He says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, which means be dead, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. The trumpet will sound, and the dead, in, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we, the rest of us, shall all be changed. This is the resurrection that believers can look forward to. It doesn't matter if you've died already or if you're still alive at the end of time. We're all going to go through the same thing. We have that hope of resurrection. And that's why when we grieve those that have gone on before us, those that have died in Christ, we still have a hope of that, re, of that, of that, of that, of that, of that reuniting up in heaven with resurrected bodies and spirits that will be together with the Lord forever, to forever and ever be with the Lord. But there's a second part of the harvest, which is not so hopeful and happy ending-ish. Going back to Revelation 14, it goes on and says... Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, the altar who has authority over the fire. And he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle. 
Put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the great harvest of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city, and blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia. This is not a harvest for the Thanksgiving table, but a harvest for fiery destruction. We understand the process. At the end of the summer, we clean out our gardens. We take out all of the good stuff, and what's left behind is all the old vines and stalks and weeds that are still there that need to be cleaned out and destroyed. And this kind of process is what's being likened to here. God takes out the good fruit. He takes out the good harvest, and then he sees what's left. And that part is destroyed. The people who are alive at the second coming of the Lord, who did not repent and follow him, who took the mark of the beast to worship him, will be harvested as well and thrown into the fire. Next week, as we move through Revelation, we get to the part that takes a close look at what eternal damnation looks like. It's not a popular or upbeat topic. In fact, as I even dread sitting down to work on that sermon. Who wants to hear a fire and brimstone sermon, right? We don't like that kind. You're going, well, okay, I'm not going to come next week and hear a sermon about hell. That's not one I really want to come to. But if there's a heaven, there's a hell. If there's a forever with God, there's a forever without God. And that forever without God kind of has a good news, bad news kind of flip side to it. The bad news means that there is the eternal damnation of real humans, people, maybe even people that we know and love, those who we don't know as well throughout the world, people who have refused the good news of having a relationship with God that comes through Jesus. And so that's the bad side of it. It's very tragic and sad. But the good news on the flip side is that people who don't love God or obey God or follow God, and they do the exact opposite, they would really mess up a good thing that God sets up in his eternal kingdom in heaven, wouldn't they? If they're unrepentant and not wanting to worship him and follow him, then they can't be a part of what the people who long for truth and righteousness are longing after. So God is going to wipe out Satan, the demons, the people who are bent on evil and make the good news of the sacrifice of Jesus a mockery. They will receive their just punishment, which is eternal separation from God. And that's what this second harvest is about. And once that happens, God is free then to recreate and set up a kingdom that runs as perfectly as God intended it to run. And nothing will ever mess it up again. Jesus told a parable about the harvest that applies to us in the here and now. In Matthew 13... He said, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat, and he went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came to him and said, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How does it have weeds? I don't know, I get weeds no matter what I put in there, right? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servants said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No. Lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. I'm sure you've done that. Pulling weeds, you end up pulling a good plant out. Done that too. Okay. You know, Jesus isn't too worried that this world is filled with both good wheat and bad weeds. He says, let them grow together. And we wonder sometimes why God doesn't justify things now. Why bad people are allowed to continue doing bad while good people often suffer at the guilty hands. But God is patient. And he asks us to be patient because the harvest will come in due time. But for now, we live in a field where both God and the arch enemy of our souls have sowed their seeds. 
and they're all mixed together. And we look around at the weeds in our world and we just wish we could pull them up, don't we? We wish we could fix it. We wish we could get rid of it. We don't want the evil people out there continuing what they're doing. But Jesus says, be patient. Let him handle it. When all is said and done, he will take care of it. Because the harvest isn't ready yet. It's getting closer to the time, but not yet. There are still others that are going to come in to be a part of the harvest. And do you remember what harvest Jesus saw? We read it verse earlier back in Matthew 9. It says, when he saw the crowds of people, he had compassion for them. I mean, do we have, do we have compassion for those that need the Lord out there? Or do we just shake our fist at the evil and wish they would go away and be damned forever and ever? Jesus had compassion. He wants to have compassion because they were harassed and helpless and like sheep without a shepherd. That's why they're like that. They're helpless. They're harassed. They're like sheep without a shepherd. You know, it's so easy, and we do this all the time. We, we judge people because they are so unwise and they, they do bad things and everything. And then later on we find out maybe something about them that makes us feel a little bit sorry. We understand that they turned out like that because of circumstances in their life. Maybe they haven't had good teachers. They haven't had a chance to be able to learn what is right and wrong. You, you know, it's because they're harassed and helpless. They're like sheep without a shepherd. So Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. See, he looks at the fields while the, it's still growing good fruit, and he's waiting for them to be ready at the harvest. And we say, God, why don't you come back tomorrow? Can we just, like, can we just like get this over with before 2020 is over with? Could we just like end it all, dear Lord Jesus? But he says, I'm not ready yet. There's still people out there that need to come in, and he wants us to be praying about the harvest that's out there. He says we need to pray for the harvest. We need to pray that there would be more laborers in the harvest. Not just praying that the harvest would grow, but it would do it through people like you and me. So that we would have compassion on those that are harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Who do you know that's harassed and helpless and like a sheep without a shepherd? Maybe there's some people that come to mind there's some people like that in our world, in our lives, and we could come up with a lot of names, and it's not hard because we live in a world that's full of that. A lot of harassed, helpless, and shepherdless people out there, and actually you and I were one of those before we knew the grace and love of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So we need to pray. Let that be a part of our prayers, that we're praying that God will send someone to them, and you never know. You might even be the answer to your own prayer. God may send us as we pray for those that are helpless and harassed and need a shepherd. The harvest is coming, and we're invited to be there. The resurrection, the restoration, the recreation of everything, justice and judgment will all come together at some point. So which side of the harvest are we on? Which side of the harvest are we on for eternal life or the side that's harvested for eternal destruction? Jesus can plant good seeds in our life which brings about fruit for him. Part of the fruit of growing in God's harvest is being able to produce more fruit. What fruit are we bringing into our lives? Whose lives are we touching out there? Our example, our love, our service, our words of life that we share with people, our prayers, they do make a difference. And as we sing the song before communion, and as we go into communion, let's remember the sacrifice of Jesus and let's commit ourselves to being part of the harvest of souls that more will know and believe and follow Jesus. I'd like us to pray and then we'll sing the song Because He Lives and then we'll go into communion.